So in the last video, we were looking at ways of approximating the function f that we were trying to learn and we talked about how it is expensive to estimate the Fourier coefficients of each of its terms in the expansion even if you were selecting just a few terms. So I thought we will now use an example to try and go through those points one by one and see how if we do this right it would help us in actually learning f. So now the last slide that we saw in the previous video segment was this one where we talked about estimating f hat of s for a given set s where f hat could be in the preferred set script f of coefficients associated with sets like s and we mentioned in passing in the previous video that we could take some sort of an expectation using the samples that we were drawing the examples but what you saw in the expectation was actually the function f that we were trying to learn so this could be somewhat confusing if we don't have a little bit more explanation so let's try to remind ourselves first before we try and get into that explanation as to what the relationship is between the function f we are trying to learn and its Fourier coefficients f hat. So this is a formula we have seen so many times that by now we would have committed it to memory. The classical form from the previous uh, lectures on Fourier spectra or Fourier expansion is a function f can be written as a sum of the sets x sup s times its Fourier coefficients. So what you can intuitively easily infer here is fx can be inferred from f hat. But what the previous slide seemed to imply was we somehow switched actors. And now we were pretending that we could, and I, I believe uh, that's a correct conclusion, uh, infer f hat from f. And that's why we are going to now spend a couple of minutes trying to understand why that is indeed reasonable and how to do that. So to understand that, let me first point out a general fact. What we are trying to do as an overarching goal in this lecture is try to convince ourselves that the function f can be learned from a small number, hopefully, of important Fourier coefficients of the form f hat then we set about determining f hat. Of course, to determine f hat completely and precisely, once again we are stuck with the same problem that we have to look at possibly 2 to the n inputs in order to do this well. But we do know, and that's been the running theme now for the past few video segments, that we are hoping to learn f from a small, and small to be quantified, set of its input. So there was this example oracle that was throwing up examples at us and we were trying to learn f from that. So in order to be able to estimate f hat, it would be very reasonable to try and use the same examples if we can without complicating matters further and try and learn the significant or dominant terms of the form f hat, the Fourier coefficients. However, in order to do that, we need to know one additional important fact. And that's what was implicit in the slide that I opened this video lecture with. So we saw how to construct, looking at the slide now, fx from f hat s. Now let us consider the opposite question, which is what we are faced with and what we somewhat, without explanation, claimed in the slide we just walked through a couple of minutes ago, that f hat s could somehow be estimated from fx. Why is that the case? I mentioned just now one reason, that it would be nice if we could use the same examples we are using to learn uh, the function f itself. That's one reason. The other reason is, we are given by the oracle knowledge of f our hands are tied in that we are given knowledge 
exactly and only in that form. We know nothing else about f. Remember that the whole exercise here is to learn f. So we know nothing more about f than what the oracle tells us. So to some extent, beyond being nice, there is nothing else that we can do. So we are in a sense forced to learn f hat from whatever we know, obviously. And what do we know? We know that fx has particular values for randomly chosen inputs. And we know the inputs and those values given by this oracle. Now, fortunately for us, and in general, this is a mathematical fact, we know that this somewhat counterintuitive idea of flipping the role of f and f hat is also true. It turns out mathematically that f hat s for any particular s can be estimated as an expectation of fx times x sup s. Remember that x sup s is the term associated with f hat s and therefore s is the common connecting link between these terms. And this formula essentially says that you can average over all inputs of f, all inputs, two to ten inputs, you get a precise estimate of f hat. So in words, given a set s, we can multiply the function value fx, this is now the actual function we are trying to learn, with xs or x sup s, take the expectation over all possible x values and you have two to the end of those and you have a perfect estimate of f hat s. The symbol here which we used in the past, the e with the subscript x tilde minus one comma one raised to the power n, that simply is a shorthand just to remind you and we used this in the past is the expectation or averaging over inputs minus one comma one of length n drawn uniformly at random. That's simply a shorthand notation for that. If you wish to understand in mathematical detail the whole issue of how you can switch the roles of f and f hat and why f hat s as expressed in this equation here is indeed the expected value of fx times x sup s averaged over all inputs or uniformly drawn inputs uh, from the input distribution, then you, I, I suggest you refer, refer our source material for this. And we look at the source material, uh, which is Professor Ryan O'Donnell's book, which is also called Analysis of Boolean Functions. In chapter one, in at least the latest version of the book, Proposition 1.8, gives you this relationship. So in order to construct the approximation though, because we cannot average over all inputs and hope to get two to the end inputs, using this is expensive. So a reasonable approximation we hope is to average the values of this product fx times x sup s on the examples we have from the oracle. That's our hope. And moving forward in the example and in the next lecture, the second lecture on machine learning, we will represent this approximation as f tilde s. So f tilde s is an approximation of the term f hat s. And once we have this framework in our mind and we believe it, the next thing to ask is, how close an approximation to the original function f do we get by now approximating in two ways. We don't look at all the f hat terms and each f hat term is itself approximated by f tilde. So that's the question in front of us. Let's go through a simple example to understand this and we will come back in the next lecture to actually understand the full scope of how well we can do this in a mathematically rigorous way through a theorem and its proof. So in our example, let's go back to looking at a Boolean function. We're trying to learn it. And instead of the restriction we have placed on ourselves to study Boolean functions that take inputs and map only into values that are either plus one or minus one, we will relax that constraint temporarily now. And instead look 
at Boolean functions in the general form, which would take inputs of the form minus 1, 1, but rather map them into any real numbered value, which is the general definition of a Boolean function. For this example, let's suppose that for the set 1, f hat the term is 0 0.86 and f hat for the set 2 is 0 0.5. And more interestingly, for this particular Boolean function, all the other subsets have Fourier coefficients that are zero. So there are only two non-zero coefficients for this particular Boolean function. And as always, our oracle gives us uniformly distributed inputs. And these are drawn at random. And let's consider that we drew three examples. It turns out that since this is an oracle that can draw inputs uniformly at random, there is a chance that you would get an input more than once. So just to illustrate that possibility in this example again, we constructed x1 to be a certain input vector. And if you notice, function f is defi defined to be accepting inputs that are indexed on three values. It's a three-dimensional function or it's a three tuple, a triple, etc. So that's captured, of course, by this value three that is next to the minus one comma one notation here. So you have three inputs. The third input is different, and it's one minus one and one. And in each case, the value of the function itself given by our friendly oracle is written here minus 1.36, minus 1.36, and plus 0.36. So that's our function. That's what we know about it. We're now trying to see how well we could learn. We know nothing more. One thing that we did talk about is the concept of epsilon concentration on a collection of the Fourier coefficients, right? So for a given set, the definition of epsilon concentration talked about the sums f hat s square on sets outside the collection of our interest. So if you are an important set, the end epsilon concentrated, just to remind ourselves, the definition said sum the squares of the coefficients outside that set, and the sum of that should be less than or equal to epsilon. So if you are an important set, everybody else should sum to less than or equal to epsilon. That was the way we defined it. So if you look at the particular values, and we'll borrow those from the previous slide, if, uh, then we also, for purposes of the theorem that we are about to prove, used in the th statement of the theorem epsilon by 2. So the Fourier spectrum of f is concentrated in this example on the first set, s equal to 1, because if you take the other set, namely set 2, is the only other set which had a non-zero coefficient, take its uh, Fourier coefficient value, which in this example we said was half, square it, that's 0.25, and therefore if epsilon by 2 is less than equal, uh, equal to 0.25, epsilon can be less than equal to half. But if you apply that to set 1, and therefore consider set 2 to be a candidate, then our candidate 2, this would be 0.86 square, because that was the coefficient associated with set 1. If you square, that's 0.75. And then, of course, if you go from epsilon by 2 to epsilon, that would uh, give us a value of 1.5, which is clearly greater than half. So it's outside our tolerable value for epsilon. Hence, we have decided, based on this simple calculation in this example, that our high value set of coefficients has just one entry in it, and that's f hat of 1. That these are, I'm just walking through the definitions and applying them to the example. So the second now round of approximations. What did we do just now? We have, we have decided, and we'll see how good our decision is, to approximate f with one of its coefficients f hat, and that was f hat 1. 
Now we are stuck with actually determining f hat 1 and we do not know how to do that because we can't look at all inputs. However, if you remember, we had a second layer of approximation and that involved looking at the three examples we had here, three in in example instances, and using those to estimate f hat 1. And I referred you to the book and a proposition in order to understand how one looks at these examples to actually approximately evaluate f hat 1, and we will do that now. So, in order to estimate f hat 1, we know these three pairs, value x1, the function's value fx1, value x2, the function's value fx2, value x3, the function's value fx3. So for s equal to 1, it's an easy exercise to determine that x sup s equal to 1 when the bit at, that, at position 1 is 1 and it, the value is minus 1 otherwise. So that's literally an application of the definition of how x sup s is constructed. So now let's take this insight. So we look at these first positions because we are only interested in, in this particular example using f hat 1 and we are now trying to estimate it. So for the example, the three vectors we chose were these three, minus 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, plus 1, minus 1, 1. And fx1 is minus 1.36, fx2 is minus 1.36, fx3 is plus 0.36. So if we take this definition of x sup s and now take the fx values which, you, which are here, one, minus 1.36, minus 1.36 and plus 0.36 and just multiply them by applying the definition of x sup s, the end result is this, plus 1.36, plus 1.36 and minus 0.36. Now we are going to average. That's because the definition called for estimating f hat using the expected value of the inputs drawn uniformly. So given that these are the values, and this is such a simple calculation, I hope you'll take my word for it, that the average value was 0.786. We just did that on a piece of paper, let's say with a pencil. So our approximate term now, f tilde 1 of f hat 1 is 0.786. So once we have f tilde 1, we now can approximate the function f we are trying to learn. Using our old terminology, what we are turning, trying to learn is called a concept. What we have approximately learned is a hypothesis, if you remember. So how good is h if we used f tilde 1 in order to try and construct it? And what does the quality of h mean? We are defined an error, which is a distance function between the actual value you want to learn and what you've learned. So in order to go the distance, hx is f tilde 1 times x sup 1. That's our approximation, right? Because we're only using one Fourier coefficient in this particular example. So the expected square error as defined, expectation of f minus h square, if you just write out the expansion and do the full calculation, which you can walk through step by step in a straightforward way here, uh, is 0.3822, which is clearly bound above or less than equal to the goal we set for ourselves, epsilon of half. So it, surprisingly, with this much approximation, we still get a very good estimate of the function we are trying to learn given this bound of half in this case. So since the theorem promised us an error less than 0.5, it delivered. We now have the value. There was one additional parameter in the context of pack learning that we had to discuss, and that was the confidence level. So you learned this, but what is the chance that you learn this repeatedly, or what's the probability you learn it with? So in this particular example, this 1 minus delta parameter 
is captured not directly but indirectly by the examples that we drew. So in a sense, the examples give us the probability with which it is correct. When we walk over to the next lecture and actually look at the theorem in detail, we will also see a way of calculating this probability. So that's a summary of how the theorem plays out through an example, but there are two salient points we learned through this example. You can approximate f, the function we are trying to learn, by its Fourier coefficients, by picking a subset, making the problem more tractable, and each of those coefficients could in turn be approximated by expect doing uh, conducting or calculating an expectation only on the examples drawn there through this new form of f hat called f tilde. Then we took f hat and then used it to calculate how well we did relative to having f tilde. And we concluded in this slide that we did within the bounds of what the theorem guaranteed us. So just a few remarks is, and something we will look closely when we study the theorem. This entire process very much depends on the existence of this all-knowing oracle that gives us good examples. One could easily think of a situation where an oracle gives us examples that are not helpful. And the nature of these guarantees that we have is that the average or the expected value is good. That is, it's close to the true value. And we have defined the error here to be slightly different from the definition of distance of Boolean functions that we had used earlier. We'll go back to using that definition of error in the future, and we're aware of that, of course. This was an illustrative example with using this particular uh, definition of error. And with this background, starting with the next lecture, we will move over to a more, more formal approach, a mathematical approach, to proving the theorem. Thank you. That ends this lecture.